Well, welcome, Felix, to Copy That Pops. Hey, thank you so much for having me. Or should I say, willkommen? Willkommen, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I remember when we talked German for a little bit. I know, that was so exciting. I Anytime I meet someone at a networking event who speaks German, I'm like instantly like, hey, let's talk, because I'm so excited to practice. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, and you showed me the German music and everything. That was yeah. really cool. <laughs> so how do you introduce yourself at a networking event? That's actually where we met. Was at uh, the premiere of Ambitious Adventures TV show. <laughs> yeah, um, so that's a tough one. I would say it really depends which event I'm at. Um, you know, if I'm somewhere where, that's, where it's a more creative environment, I might talk about my book. Um, if I'm at an entrepreneurship convention, I probably only mention my company, Funtus. Uh, it really depends, you know, on the circumstance. I always try to like listen in on yeah. what would that person I'm engaging with be most interested in. That's really smart. Yeah, I'm like that too. I have so many different things going on. It's kind of a good thing to kind of feel it out, the situation and the person That's you're right. talking with and, and see. So you are from Germany and you said in your bio, it says from Southwest Germany. What city did you grow up in? So I grew up in this very small city. It, it, it only got 10,000 people. Uh -huh. It's called Bad Mergentheim. And it's like an hour away from Stuttgart and Frankfurt. So the funny thing is the city I grew up in has fewer people than the university I went to in the U.S. <laughs> so, you know, it's, I grew up like in a, it's, it's a small town, you know. Yeah. And you came over when you were 13. Yep. When I was 13, back in 2008. Um, was very interesting time, you know, I was, yeah. the, you know, 13, that was a specific age, and then also it, the time in, in space, you know, 2008 was a, sp a big year in, in America, the year Obama got elected, the mm -hmm. economic crisis, I think it was a very shaping year uh, for the U.S. Yeah, so why did your parents come to the U.S., or was it just you? <laughs> well, it, it was me, my brother, and my mom. Uh, initially, it was meant as just one year of American experience. We wanted to know what it's like uh, living in the U.S., experience the culture, uh, get better at our English, because initially the idea was we spend one year there, have that experience, and then go back, you know, as bigger and better people uh, to Germany. But it just turned out that, you know, we had so much opportunities here that we decided, you know what, we can't go back just now. We got to stay and make the most out of these opportunities. Oh, how interesting. And so tell us about what you did in college, because you did a lot of really interesting things. So I kind of want to hear your perspective of you just jumped right in. Yeah, uh, yeah college. I mean, I just graduated two weeks ago. Wait, so two now, weeks ago. <laughs> two weeks ago. So I finally get to look at it in retrospect of you know, the past four years. So one big thing about college, first of all, was I didn't start immediately. I decided to take a gap semester which was one of the best decisions I've made simply because it allowed me to kind of get that macro view over life and like look at like, you know, what do I actually want to do and decide what I want to do and learn a lot more uh, than just jump right into classes. That was big. Um, the next thing was, I mean, college, I would say the majority, the majority of the things I learned in college happened outside the classroom. Mm -hmm. um, so that could have been, you know, extracurricular stuff like my fraternity life, or it could have been, the things I literally did outside of class, like, you know, participating in startup weekend, going, taking entrepreneurship boot camps and doing all these things that the general classrooms didn't offer because, you know, now in, I'm an entrepreneur, but I took entrepreneurship class in college and I got like a B, I think, because, you know, it was all multiple choice tests. It had nothing to, to do with reality. Yeah. And, you know, it just, it just didn't give me what I wanted. And the only reason I guess I finished college is because I'm a, I guess I'm a perfectionist in a sense that like I, I don't quit anything, you know, it's like I know I can do it. I'm just going to finish it, you know, because otherwise I'll beat myself up about it, even though there was not not that much in it for me. Mm -hmm. So I saw also on your bio that you did the debate team. Yeah. So I want to hear some tips around because you're like a national debater. Tell us about that and some tips that someone could take away for making better arguments. <laughs> Right, absolutely. So debate is something I did very actively in my high school times. I would go to a different debate tournament every single weekend, and it ended up being like 80 tournaments that I went to. So wow. the biggest takeaways, and there's, there's, there's a lot, because I started off as an immigrant with horrible English, <laughs> where I was getting a last round after round after round, and I literally had to learn English from scratch, meaning I had to learn how do you make certain sounds with your mouth. And I watched YouTube videos on how to do so. Wow. Um, 
So that's the first takeaway. Um, if you're an immigrant or if you have a certain way of speaking that's not proper, just break it down to the indi- to the individual sounds um, of and how of how, that how you pronounce it wrong and look them up on the internet or have mm. somebody show you how they do it. But then again, the average person doesn't know how they no, do it. It's that's just true. a natural mecha- mechanism. Can you give us a specific example of maybe something? Right. Yeah. Sure. So uh, initially, for me, the the R sound and the W sound used to be identical. <laughs> so right and white would sound the same. So basically, what you do in Germany, the R, you just pronounce like very, I guess, flat, like with like you don't move your tongue a lot. So it would would be like I don't know if I can do it now. Right and white, right, right. Yeah, I don't know. Like you don't do much. Basically, the uh-huh. American way, you gotta roll up your tongue and like it's it's this weird thing. You look it up on YouTube. You can do like <laughs> how, just look up how to pronounce the American R, and you will see what you unconsciously do. Wow. Yeah. Um, yeah, and I learned that from scratch. So th- that's one thing. If you're an immigrant, um, and then further, I mean, how about I think the, the biggest... T H sound? Sorry to interrupt you. Was yeah. That... For me, that wasn't a big thing because I've I've always noticed that, uh-huh. and I mean, for some reason, Germans are really obnoxious about that. Like they always like it's just so stereotypical, you uh-huh. know. Like it's so stereotypical that like I knew not to do it. Uh-huh. Um, yeah, I know <laughs> the good. H sound is really strong for Germans. The R sound is oftentimes not that good for Germans. There's a lot of them, mm. um, but over time. You know, if you actually consciously work on it, you'll fix it. But it's not going to happen by itself because right. that's how you know there's there's plenty of immigrants that have been in the country for 60 years, 50 years, and they still speak as if they just you know got off the airplane or the, off the boat. Um, so it's all about conscious effort of improving it. I love that. I mean, and that's so applicable to everything that you're trying to improve on is. Yeah. Just recognize something small that could really make a difference and consciously mm-hmm. put some effort behind it. Yeah. And the funny thing is now when I listen to some people with accents, usually it's not, you know, it's you think like, wow, there's so much wrong with it. There's all these things of how they pronounce it. But usually it's maybe a few vowels that are pronounced differently. Maybe it's like the O sound or maybe it's that they extend certain sounds. So if you change one, two or three things, all of a sudden right. they would sound like a perfect American accent. That's and so cool. this doesn't mean that you should like, you know, lose your individualism. I think accents have something awesome but what you got to make sure is that you're understandable because you shouldn't let that language or that accent get in the way of you making you know convincing arguments for example for sure yeah i mean when we first met i could tell that you weren't from the us but i couldn't place it and normally i can place especially german accents since i speak german and spent so much time there so Mm -hmm. i think that's like a great example that you have some uniqueness but you're so clear too. You almost can't place from where. (laughs) Yeah. I've, I've heard everything. People thought I'm from Russia, Germany, Ireland, Brazil, (laughs) Spain, I've everything in the world. (laughs) (laughs) That's awesome. So what else from debating did you learn about communication Mm -hmm. and yeah, I think one of the big skills that people really need to learn is extemporaneous speaking. Mm -hmm. Uh, and the funny thing is cause I, it was like a 180 now, I d- decided to take public speaking last semester in college because I wanted an easy class since I already know how to do it. So I saw the struggles people have when they first get started and people are so stuck to the page. And I think also reading takes away so much from your presentation and it takes away that confidence, you know, because if you take away the paper from them, they start stammering and all that kind of stuff. So um, I think a good exercise what you could do is, you know, try like, Try to give a speech, like you might even write it out, you might prepare it, but then t- say, okay, I can't use the paper now, I have to break the speech down, you know, what are your main three points? Mm-hmm. And then just, you know, speak from the heart about these main three points. Like, you know the, the topic, mm-hmm. you researched it, you wrote about it, you probably experienced stuff about it in your life. Um, so the main practice you need to do is start being less reliant on the paper, because once you drop that note, notepad, your the quality of what you'll be saying increases drastically and it's something that improves over time because initially it might not look that pretty but over time when you really master that extemporaneous speaking you'll be able to like come up with some really profound things on the spot in the moment Mm -hmm. and that also allows you to have that you know those make those powerful gestures have that eye contact and just be in the moment i think that's what it's about becoming a great speaker is being able to be in the moment and just have like a stream of consciousness while still making sense. Yeah, I love that. And I mean, how you write 
is different than how you speak. So if you mm-hmm. write a speech only as written and then try to deliver it just kind of by reading it, right. you're missing so much of what really makes a great speech. Yeah, and oftentimes those written speeches, they just sound so mm-hmm. formulaic and so, so so prepared, you know? Like, you know, you're probably just throwing some bigger words and all that kind of stuff. And right. it, it, it doesn't connect as well. You know, you want to find ways and it's also – it's not just about the words on the pages, it's about how you say them. And usually when you read, you do it in a more monotone way, mm-hmm. but when you speak, it's more, it's, it's like an act. You know, yeah. you, you act it out, and you, you, you put more of your heart in, which, uh, you know, I've noticed in debate, I started, uh, and it, the funny thing is once you get good at extemporary speaking, it also means you have to prepare less. Uh, yeah. You know, we still prepare, <laughs> but you don't, it's not such, it's not like an evening long process of you writing out a speech, it's more like, you know, what really strikes me? What really, you know, what do you think would appeal to this audience? And you jot down a few main points mm-hmm. and then you just talk about them. Mm-hmm. And it's, it's less, it, it feels less like work and it's a better result. I love that. I mean, even just with this podcast, it's now just over a year that I've been going. And when I first started, I actually started when I was living in Germany. So this podcast mm-hmm. originated in Germany, which is fun. That's awesome. But I used to prepare so much for every interview. I wrote out like specific word for word questions. I researched the guests like a ton and I was really nervous and like over prepared. And now I just write a couple of little sticky notes because I'm like, I want to shout out Felix's Instagram. Follow him at Felix underscore Hartman with two N's. You know, so. Oh, thank you. <laughs> and I just write a couple little notes to remind myself of, you know, if the conversation as it's flowing, if I kind of forget something to ask next, that I've got some like an anchor point to go back to. Oh, yeah, I mm-hmm. want to ask you about XYZ. Yeah. But I just let it flow so much more. And I feel like I'm a better speaker after practicing for a year. And I feel mm-hmm. like the interviews are more interesting if it really is that ebb and flow versus like structured question answer, right. question answer. Absolutely. Cause I think it's all about trusting yourself in the way that, um, when you write out that speech and you think, Oh, I have to like, I have to say the sentences exactly the order I wrote them down right. because that's the perfect way, but just forget about it. Like, you know what you're going to say, you know? So if a, if a word or two is off, it doesn't matter. Yeah. Um, it's all about, you know, just like trusting yourself and knowing that you know the material for sure. And do you find that your writing has improved as well as your speaking has improved? Maybe specifically for business, do you try to write like you speak now because it does connect more? What are your thoughts on that? That's a that's a great question. Just because I'm I'm a fiction like I'm mm-hmm. I'm a fiction writer also. Mm-hmm. So like, but fic, fiction writing is completely different than let's say writing a blog or writing an email. Yeah. Um, but I would say the stuff like email. Co- correlates a lot more to how I speak, you know, because it's just more written in that natural voice that I would speak in. Um, and I do think it helps just because it's, you refine it over time. Mm-hmm. And there, there is more impact, you know, you, you, you can, you're able to create more impact with your words when you really put more thought into it, which I think is, it's unfortunately, you know, language is a skill that has been really neglected by many. Because, right. you know, people, I know many people say, hey, you know, college, schools, it's, it's it's worthless. It's stupid. And I get that, you know, a lot of parts are, but being able to communicate properly are so powerful and so important. And I already mentioned this yesterday on a different podcast where I said, you know, look, sometimes I'm trying to hire people for stuff like, you know, writing blog posts, creating content and all that stuff. And all too often people, they're just not comfortable with, you know, composition anymore, or they hate it or they're not good at it. So I think, you know, if you're an entrepreneur, Communication is one of your top priorities because it will apply when you're pitching to investors. It will apply when you are in front of a crowd talking about your product. It will apply when you talk managing your team. Mm. It's just key. That's so true. Whether it's spoken or written, so many ways we have to be able to communicate with each other. I mean, we're social creatures and that's like the bridge between a customer or an investor and you and your business is communication. So you have to be able to bridge that gap. Definitely. Mm -hmm. Well, okay, jumping to the fact that you are a writer and also in fiction, tell us about your book, Dark Age. Yeah, so Dark Age was my debut novel. Uh, I published it in 2016 in June, and since then it's been doing pretty good. You know, I was on the Amazon bestsellers for almost three months in a row, Uh, so it was holding its place. Uh, I got nominated for a bunch of major literary awards like the Prometheus Awards, the Dragon Awards. 
um, and some others are in the pipelines. But basically what Dark Age is about, it's it's a post-apocalyptic novel taking place a hundred years in the future after the nuclear third world war. Mm. And so this young man grows up in a secluded city ruled by a dogmatic religious tyrant. And you know, he he lives under this dogmatic regime and he wants to break out of it because he's getting sent out to war for ten years. But the only way, you know, to break uh, that tyranny is to find out the truth of what really happened in the past. Mm. So he goes off on his quest to find out the truth. And it's a little bit like a Pandora's box effect where the more he finds out about the past, the more challenges get thrown his way. And the book explores a lot of, uh, you know, deeper material as well um, from uh, existentialism to the rebel versus tyrant dichotomy. Uh, to light versus darkness, you know, recognizing that everyone has the, their own side to the story, that there's no right or wrong, but rather that mm. there's just lots and lots of gray zones. And in a way, it was a little bit inspired by my political research I was doing early on in 2000, I mean, throughout the years, but in 2014, for example, when I did a lot more of the writing, I, I was studying the Middle East. I was mm. uh, the Arab Spring at the time. And what was going on is basically, and that was already 2012 when I first started writing the book, there was all these civil wars happening. And there's the rebels who said there's this evil dictator who's doing all these awful things to us. Mm. And then you went to the government's website and they said, hey, there's all these terrorists instigating things. So whichever, and there's, there were supporters for both sides. So whichever side you looked on, they had their own narrative, you know, and that's why we have so many problems in the world because um, people are so convinced of the narrative without even recognizing that there's another narrative on the other side. Um, so that the book explores a lot of that because every character is dynamic. There's no just bad guy, good guy, um, which, you know, I just really enjoyed writing. Yeah. So how do you even go about approaching writing a fiction novel? I'm all nonfiction. I've never mm -hmm. sat down to write anything really creative, so I'm fascinated by it. <laughs> I, I've been, I mean, fiction writing is my oldest passion. Mm -hmm. I've been writing fiction since elementary school. Like literally, like I have this little booklet that I wrote in elementary school. Then I went on to another book in, um, what is it, like lower school, I guess, and back in Germany. And then I started another thing, another thing. I've, I've been writing fiction my whole life. Uh, Dark Age is just the first book I decided to publish. Um, how do I go about it? I mean, I just mm -hmm. I just have these ideas every now and then. I mean, mm -hmm. if you're living in that creative world, they just come to you. Mm -hmm. Like, I wish I could say, this is my five step plan to yeah. coming up with a creative idea. But generally, a lot of times, sometimes I literally have like a really cool dream. And then I'm like, I could make a story out of this, you know, and then I <laughs> throughout the next, let's say 10 hours or so, like, I keep spinning it and spinning it and writing down ideas of like, how could I expand this? So Oh, like my favorite question, what if, you know, so you have a scenario, but then you're like, wait, but what if the character did this? Or what if these got people were related in this way or this would happen? And uh -huh. then, you know, one thing leads to the next, the next, the next. And then at some point I have a much bigger story that I'm looking at. And really the time when I pursue the story, when I actually put the time in to write it, which it's a lot of time, uh, it has to get to the point where I'm like, wow, like this is a story that needs to be told, you know? Mm. So it's not just about having an exciting narrative. I also want to make sure that there's a lot of subtext and it discusses a lot of themes um, that I think need to be talked about. That's so fascinating. I love that. I still need to read Dark Age. It's on my list. <laughs> awesome. I definitely will. And so how about the Amazon bestseller? Because I'm, as we're recording this, my course is just going live on how to hit Amazon bestseller. Mm -hmm. And you kept it at the number one spot for three months. Yeah. So what are some things that you did to get to the top of the list and then keep it there? Okay, so get to the top of the list. I did two, three months, four months of free marketing. Nice. You know? So mm -hmm. I did um, Twitter, Instagram. I was big on social media. And the funny thing is a lot of authors, especially fiction authors, don't do that because um, – my benefit is is that I'm both a writer and a marketer. Mm -hmm. Most writers, they just like they hide in their in their house. They probably have right. twenty Facebook friends, and this is not giving hate to writers, but like right. just like the nature of a lot of fiction, especially new fiction writers, they wouldn't have the network that I have. So my benefit coming in right away was I know how to run Twitter, I know how to run Instagram, and I built myself a fo like massive following. By the time I launched Dark Age, literally the Dark Age accounts had. Um, probably 10 to 15,000 followers, just the book account. Um, wow. So that was good. That definitely helped me. 
and I just kept it active with um, daily content um, that I posted um, they, like every single day. Like anytime I got a review, I would post that review on my Facebook account. Um, I would make quote images on Instagram. I would post them on Twitter. When anybody tweeted at me that they read the book or liked the book, I would retweet, I would respond to them. I just kept it engaging. Um, and of course, I mean, I also ran ads. It wasn't anything crazy, but especially in the beginning, I ran Facebook ads. I, I still run Amazon ads because the amazing thing about Amazon ads, it tells you exactly what is your return of investment. So for example, I have some ads where uh, for every dollar I earn, I only spend 18 cents. So I have no reason to turn them off because yeah. they keep basically printing money for me. So it's just playing around with them until you find that that right spot. And it's just you gotta keep putting time and time and effort in because I think too many people they publish a book and then all right I'm a published author or maybe for maybe for one day maybe for an hour they hit Amazon bestseller and mm -hmm. that's the check check mark off the list but for me you know I wanted more so I kept on it and I also noticed that you know once I got really focused on funders on the company I stopped promoting and the ranks are to fall now I found ways to kind of do both so things have been picking it back up but um, it just if you're an author, you got to be comfortable with marketing. Yeah, that's so true. That that is so true. That's what I found as well. If you're not constantly marketing it and finding ways to keep it at the top of mind and getting new readers, then your book will start to fall in the ring. So mm -hmm. and then it's found less organically as well. So it's kind of like one of those things. If you can keep it up, then yeah. organically people are going to find it as well. I'm gonna have to try some of those Amazon ads. I like that. <laughs> yeah, this, I mean the sales rank that's key. I mean I, it's it's weird like sometimes no book gets sold for like let's say two days But then Suddenly let's say five people buy it and then it goes up and then yeah. all of a sudden Sales rank kicks in and then people it's more and more and more and all of a sudden it's back to the top So it's as long as you can stay the top like just make it to the top 100 or top 50 and you you can find a way to stay there mm -hmm. That's really cool. So yeah, so let's trans transition then to fund this because that is your new passion company yeah. and you're the CEO of that. So tell us about fund this and what is it doing in the crowdfunding space? Right. So fund this is a brand new innovative crowdfunding platform. We are a competitor to Kickstarter and Indiegogo that you might know. And what makes us different and the reason why we exist is because we wanted to solve an old problem that has existed with crowdfunding for all too long, being that as a creator, you're basically left all to yourself. Mm -hmm. You go out there, you see, okay, I'm gonna set up my campaign, and it's such a steep learning curve where you have to learn everything from the get-go. You have to spend tons of money on ads when you've maybe never run an ad in your life. And it, the, the crowdfunding experience has been pretty poor for the majority of the people where on the best platforms, only 30% are successful, and on the worst platforms, only 10% of people are successful. Hmm. And then the average successful campaign only raises $7,000. So all these times when we see those million dollar campaigns, it's really the outliers, you know, and it's kind of like, it's like the Hollywood dream, you know, it's like, oh, I'm gonna have a million dollar campaign. Right. But the actual truth is that as an average crowdfunder, you won't do that well. But there's simple ways to solve that. And one of the main reasons is experience. Mm -hmm. And that's how over the years, because the platforms weren't doing anything, there's a whole market of crowdfunding consultants that has sprung up to support uh, these projects. And what, there's some good ones, but there's also some really bad ones. Mm -hmm. And the problem is that these consultancies, they charge five figures and up and take 20, 35% of whatever you raise. So there's a lot of people that get screwed over in the process. So for example, we have worked um, with some of these um, consultancies and they blew through five figures of our money and haven't returned any results. Hmm. So I mean, by now we fired them, but it was a great learning lesson for us to really see this is what crowdfunders struggle with on a day-to-day -day basis. So we wanted to create a system where we work with crowdfunders one-on-one give them the tools, give them the resource, and even pay for some of the ads mm. to help them reach success at no upfront cost. Hmm. So how do you guys stay in business then? Right, so we take, instead of taking the 5% that Kickstarter and Indiegogo takes, currently we take 12%. Now that number might change throughout the years, mm -hmm. um, but already at 12%, we make two and a half times the rate that a Kickstarter and Indiegogo would. And we don't accept just anyone. Mm -hmm. It's application slash invitation only. So we look for great products run by great teams. 
And furthermore, you know, we do recognize that on the average project, we are probably just going to break even, maybe even lose some money. Hmm. But, you know, the way things balance themselves out is that if we have a million dollar campaign that can pay for all that expenses or the losses that we made on, let's say, the $20,000 campaigns. But the nice thing about it is that at every point in time, our interest lies in actually reaching success for these projects because if they don't reach the goal, we literally lose money. Hmm. So the interests are aligned and there's more synergy. Interesting. Yeah, I like that. And I mean, I'm not interested right now in doing anything with crowdfunding, but I'm more familiar with it now just because of my partnership with Brandon T. Adams mm -hmm. now. But uh, it does seem if I were a creator, I like the idea of giving up a little bit more in the mm -hmm. long run to actually get more assurance that it'll even be any profit at right. all. Right. And there's no risk uh, or there's less risk right. for you because if you were by yourself, you know, you would need to invest a couple thousand dollars into getting a great video done, mm -hmm. a couple hundred dollars into getting great graphics, maybe put another few thousand to ads. And now before you even got going, yeah. you're already a couple thousand dollars out of pocket. You know, we have in-house graphic designers. We set up a studio. We, we can help make some video content. We pay for some ads, we pay for PR. So all that stuff is being done in-house. And it is all under the umbrella and under strategy. Like, you know, we, we set up the whole plan. So it's not just you saying, right. oh, I could do this over here. I could do this over there. We really work with you. And I mean, our campaigners, they love us. Um, like I, I can say that and, I, and they, they say that publicly too, just because I, I, you know, for me, it's not, oh, my, my hundred campaigns for me, it's like, oh, this is Kai, this is Roland, this is Brad, you know, like I, I know them. We build those relationships and mm -hmm. we've pushed them pretty good so far. I love that because I mean, it's like, even though I'm self motivated, there's something else about someone else being a part of the journey mm -hmm. and the process to hold me accountable to push me maybe to have strengths where I have weaknesses and really have a nice pairing that can take it further. So I love that you yeah. guys are that for people. Yeah. And especially crowdfunding, you know, some people still have that idea that all it takes is just uploading your profile, right. uh, your crowdfunding page, and money will flow in. Yeah. And maybe then they'll ask all their friends and family to donate, and they don't reach the goal. So A, they're not getting any money, plus they've already went around begging for money, and they're not gonna get it a second time. So you really gotta nail it the first time around. So, mm -hmm. you know, it's worth it, you know, having that guidance to make sure that all the check boxes are checked before you go live. Yeah, absolutely. I've, I've found that too. They kind of think, well, I'll just turn it on and I'll just automatically raise $100,000 for whatever I'm doing. <laughs> but that's not the case. And maybe it's even become more and more crowded in that space. So you really have to do it right and stand out so that it cuts through the noise and people are like, okay, I do want to contribute to this. I do want to get behind this campaign. Right. Yeah. And I mean, that's why we do our vetting because I think right. not every campaign needs to be funded. Um, there are some things where I can go on Google or Amazon and within three seconds I can find the product already existing. Mm. And stupidly enough, sometimes those projects still raise hundreds of thousands of dollars where, wow. you know, I just saw that recently on Facebook, I, I, an ad was run on me of a device I already own. <laughs> so I'm like, how did these guys manage to raise a quarter of a million dollars with something that's already in the marketplace? But hey, I, if you can, I guess. more power to you. Yeah. So what got you really uh, passionate about crowdfunding? So the way Fundus came along as an opportunity um, where I was I was brought on as CEO. So I didn't mm. uh, I didn't I wasn't one of the initial founders. I'm, I guess I'm the founder of the new vision, a new version of it. But what when I was approached with the opportunity, you know, like a lot of things started coming together for me. Meaning I've always had a passion for marketing. Uh, at the time, I was still an active trader, so I, lo I love the, 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 the stock market, I love equities and all that stuff. And given the, the concept that we will be moving into equity crowdfunding, mm -hmm. it's like a dream come true because I basically get to create you know, my, my secondary market. Um, so trading, marketing, and entrepreneurship. Because there's, there's two things I love about it. Is A, I get to work on cool things every single day. I get to work with entrepreneurs. I get to network and all that. But also, I'm somebody that has um, that loves doing new things. Mm -hmm. Meaning, if I would have to do the same startup for the rest of my life, I would probably get miserable. Like if I had to sell shoes for the rest of my life, I probably wouldn't want to do that. But if I can say, hey, you know what? This month, I'm gonna market the hell out of a shoe brand. Next month, we're gonna do like a virtual reality um, 
device. Mm -hmm. Then we're going to do um, apparently, you know, or we're going to do whiskey, you know, whatever it is, or musician or film. So I, that just really excites me because I get to try and test all these different fields, learn from them, network in them, and just experience what it's like. And then once I've had enough of it, move on to the next one. Mm -hmm. So it's it's been an incredible experience being able to work with all these creators from all these different fields. I love that. That makes so much sense. I feel like that too. I just love the variety that entrepreneurism brings. And you are specifically found a really good niche to get a taste of so many yeah. different things without having to start them from scratch yourself or keep them forever kind of a thing. You just help them out in their time of need and then let mm -hmm. them fly. Yeah, and you build those relationships. I mean, that's something yeah. else I really enjoyed, you know, because uh, if I help them reach the success, you know, they will remember. And uh, it's it's not even about, you know, re any, returning any favors. It's more about, you know, being part of all these journeys, you know? So, you know, if, if let's say 10 years down the road, maybe I can walk through a Walmart or through a, uh, through a store, like a clothing store and be like, oh yeah, I helped them get started. I helped this brand get started, you know? And like, yeah. I can look around and I just, I don't just see the products. I see the faces of the people that I helped get there. Oh, that's so cool. I love it. <laughs> All right. So if people want to learn more and connect with you, they can visit fundthis.com yes. and find you on Instagram where you're especially active. So Felix underscore Hartman and it's H-A-R-T-M-A-N-N. -N, yeah. Awesome. Yeah. Double N. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> Cool. Well, let's see. Anything else I didn't ask about you wanted to mention or any parting advice to a listener? We have a lot of ground. I mean, there's, yeah. there's always a million questions I could answer. <laughs> but I mean, just parting advice um, for your audience. I would just, you know, one of the big things, you know, you mentioned, you know, you do copywriting and marketing. One of the big things I would say, because we live in a day and age where sale, like sales is so aggressive, you know, like if I go on Facebook, it's all about like, oh, buy my stuff, buy my stuff. I think, you know, the, the, the sales marketing, because I have to do it for campaigns every single month, it's really about understanding your customer. You know, it's about finding your audience, like really niching it down. And then the whole sales process will be super easy because it's not you asking anything, it's more you providing value. It's like, hey, I have the solution to the problem you already have, rather than, you know, please, please buy my things. So people need to reverse engineer the process a little bit more where you start from where's the actual problem, mm -hmm. so then you apply the solution. Not like, hey, I have a solution, where's the problem, you know? So I start with a problem and work your way backwards. Um, and I think that will be a big game changer for your marketing. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for sharing your advice and insights and inspiration. And uh, we'll have to do a round two. Awesome. Thank you so much for having me on. Really enjoyed this. Absolutely. Okay. Talk to you later. Bye. Bye. Awesome. <laughs> Thanks so much for watching. If you want to learn more about improving your writing, hitting Amazon bestseller, psychology, or other topics I might currently be obsessed with in this online entrepreneurial world, then go to copythatpops.com. You can also connect with me on social media with my handle at laptoplaura. See you there.